Well, I want to say welcome again to Cross Community Church. We're glad that you are here today. This has been a difficult season for almost everyone I know. I don't walk around and people say like, hey, this has just been such a smooth, easy, uh, things just going really well. This has been a difficult season for almost all of us. And so I do want to say welcome to those of you who are here, those of you who are at home watching us online. Uh, we want to say welcome. We love you guys and we miss you. We look forward to a day when our whole church gets to gather once again, uh, not uh, in a limited or distant uh, fashion. Now, o- over the past couple of weeks, we've been in a series called The Wind and the Waves. Well, we've looked at some of the storms uh, that blow in our lives, the things that come in that challenge us and they test us. And we talked about, man, you have storms in your marriage, uh, storms maybe in your workplace, your occupation, what you're going through. Maybe it's just a, a difficult season for you personally with regard to your either your physical health or your mental health. Like these storms come in and it can be difficult for us as believers in Jesus Christ to know how to make sense of those things. So we're taking four weeks here to look at those storms and to say, how do we make sense of those things? And then how do we walk through those difficult things that come into our lives? So week one, we just said that God is sovereign over every single storm. No matter what we go through, we know that God was not caught off guard by it. He knew we were going to walk into that storm, and He is sufficient for us in the midst of the storm. We don't have to turn to other things, but we can turn to Christ who will lead us and walk with us through those storms. And last week, we talked about thinking about the storms and understanding that God often uses difficult circumstances as kind of a forge for our faith, where it begins to mold us and shape us and conform us to the image of Christ. Now, today I want to talk to you about a different kind of storm. It's a particular uh, type of storm that can be a, a challenge for us because it is the storm of deceit. And oftentimes, when you're being deceived, you don't know it, right? Or else you wouldn't be deceived. And so I, I want to begin by, by sharing you uh, with you a story. It's about uh, Jake and Jamie Highland and their one-year-old child named Uriel. And they lived in the Portland, Oregon area. And like many young couples, Labor Day weekend's coming up and they are making some plans. Now, again, they lived in the Portland, Oregon area. They had friends that were getting married in Spokane, Washington, and they thought, Hey, we're just going to use this as a getaway. They actually owned a piece of property in a remote portion of northern Washington state. So they're like, hey, this is going to be perfect. They hit the wedding, go hang out away from the busyness and complexity of city life. They were going to be in, I said remote northern Washington state. Uh, they were 45 minutes from the closest town. They owned this little piece of property, kind of an off-the-grid place. There was no running water or electricity. They didn't even have cell service up uh, where they were going to stay. So they did that. They went to the wedding, they roll into their their getaway, their off-the-grid escape for the weekend, and they're enjoying time with their family. But if they had known what was coming, I, I almost bet that Jake and Jamie, they would have gathered up their family and they would have fled the area before it was too late. While they were just kind of going about their day, enjoying their time off the grid, relaxing away from the complexity of their life, uh, they had no clue that a couple of hours over, a fire had begun to burn. It became a wildfire. It has been driven by the wind, and it was heading in their direction. And when they went to bed that night, they had no idea that it was headed their way. Um, investigators, as they've looked at what happened there, they've, they've reasoned that they probably were awakened early uh, on Monday morning of Labor Day uh, to the smell of smoke that had begun to kind of permeate the entire area. And so they, it looks like they got in their truck, they gathered up their family, jumped in their truck, and they began to flee uh, the fire. Uh, but the smoke was, must have been so thick and in, that coupled with the darkness that they actually ran their truck off the road through a barbed wire fence and they uh, ran into some rocks where the truck was stuck and they couldn't go any further. When Jake's cousin, who was checking on the family, found the truck, uh, it had been destroyed, completely engulfed. The windshield had been melted by the fire. And as he approached it, of course, you can imagine what he was feeling, uh, hoping that he wasn't going to find their bodies there. And luckily, he didn't. So they continued to search. There were rescuers out looking for this family. Um, and then about 24 hours later, they actually did find Jake and Jamie and baby Uriel. They had made their way on foot uh, to a, a valley. The Columbia River had run through near their property. And they found them there right next to the river, lying there on the banks. Uh, Jake and Jamie, their body had 40 or 50 percent burns, like it had been very severely burned in the fire. And uh, much to everyone's sadness, uh, baby Uriel had passed away. At the time that I read this article, 
they were still in the hospital fighting for their lives. And upon reading these, these articles, it's, uh, there was this sense of, man, this could have been so easily avoided. See, the problem with where they were, it was so isolated that even though many, many, many warning messages were sent out, it was on television, it was on the radio, there were warnings going out on cell phones, there was people trying to call and people trying to text, but because they were disconnected, they never received any of the warnings, and they suffered greatly as a result. I tell you that story this morning, not to make just an incredibly somber tone or any other thing. I tell you that story because that is the exact thing that happens to many people who are believers in Jesus Christ, who are members of God's church. The enemy comes in. They don't hear the warnings. They end up being devoured and destroyed. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Paul is actually warning the church at Ephesus against a storm that's just like this. He's warning them uh, uh, to pay attention. He actually gives them a remedy. So uh, in this text, we're going to see that God has provided protection from this particular type of storm. It is the storm of deception. If you'll remember the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve there, they are existing with God. Everything is perfect. There's no suffering. There's no dying. There's no pain. It is just a perfect relationship with God in the Garden of Eden. Everything great, right? But then Satan, the deceiver, he came in and he began to cause Adam and Eve to question the Word of God. He gets Eve off to herself and he said, hey, did God really say you couldn't eat from the fruit of this tree? Surely you won't actually die, right? You get something to question. What's really going on? Like, did God really mean that? Was he really serious when he said this about the tree? And if you know the story of Adam and Eve, the fall, you know that upon taking and eating of that fruit, sin entered the world. And what happened was like a cascade of dominoes where sin begins to wreak havoc on God's perfect creation, including ourselves. Cain killed Abel. Death, destruction, deception. It goes on and on and on, such that the storms, many of the storms that we endure today, are the result of a single act of disobedience. So, Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, he is warning the believers in the church at Ephesus, warning them against this deception. It says this in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 14, then we're going to go back and get a little more context. He says, As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Can I tell you this? You may not know this. Uh, You may be completely unaware of this. But John 10.10 tells us that we have an enemy. There is a thief on this earth. The same one who deceived Eve is ultimately out to deceive us. He is out to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, hey, although this guy is here, you have the enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. I have came that you might have life. Now, again, if you knew you were being deceived... You wouldn't be deceived, right? It would be clear. You would know, like, I'm not going to take that path. I'm not going to buy that thing. I don't want to be deceived. And yet, our enemy is very, very subtle. He is at work in our world in various ways to lead us down a path of stealing, killing, and destruction as opposed to the path of life. And so Paul, in writing to these believers in Ephesus, there were likely crazy doctrines floating around. There were people that wanted to lead them away from devotion to the faith in Christ, to lead them toward other things. He says again, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Now, it's easy for us to be like, man, what was happening in Ephesus? Like, what was happening in that city? What was going on? Those believers, how could they be led astray? But can I tell you that this is a story that I've seen play out over and over and over and over in the life of the church. Some time ago, I had a conversation with a former student of mine. Um, when he was in my student ministry, uh, I would have told you, man, this kid, he knows everything he needs to know. He is on the right path. He's got the family. He's got the knowledge. I mean, he seems to walk with Jesus like he's going to live one of those lives that's going to be you know, abundant, right? If anyone's going to get it, it's going to be him. Yet as I had a conversation with him not too long ago, I've been out of student ministry for over 10 years, so he's had some living between then and now. 
The story he told was not the story of abundance. It wasn't the story of walking with Jesus Christ and experiencing fullness of life in him. The story he told was one of destruction. The story he told was one where he has scars and wounds and hurts and broken relationships. It's one of, how did I get here? And it's one that began with just what we see here. A young man tossed here and there by waves, carried about by winds of doctrine, who had been tricked, who had been deceived, and he began to walk a path other than the path that Jesus Christ has laid out for us. If you look at verse 14, Paul says, as a result, we are no longer supposed to be deceived, right? We're no longer supposed to be tossed to and fro. We're no longer supposed to be swayed by every wind of doctrine. He says we're no longer to be children. So the perspective here, the image that he wants to paint, is that of a, an immature child. I don't know how many of you had kids, but they're pretty easy to sway, right? You can tell them things, they're going to believe it, whether it be, I can't say these things out loud, sorry, I was about to ruin Christmas for some people, but kids tend to believe some things, right? If you tell them a story, they're like, yeah, I'm in, right? And so Paul's saying, as a result of something, we should no longer be like immature children, easily bent and swayed, easily deceived. Well, as a result of what? There's something that Paul is talking about here that says this will serve as a protection for, for you and for me that keeps us from buying into these crazy doctrines that might float around from you know, being deceived by the tricks that are going to be played. Um, what is that thing? We'll get to that in just a minute, but I want to I dig in a little bit more into what it means, to this, this winds of doctrine, and what it means to be tricked or deceived. When Paul says here, no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, um, he is not talking about biblical doctrine, right? Uh, now, there are some people who might spread false doctrine and try to claim it as biblical, but what Paul is talking about here is false doctrine. It's things that are taught outside of what Scripture would ultimately teach. So um, I just want to commend you. You should be swayed by Bible doctrine. That's kind of the belief, as uh, the Scriptures, the things that have been handed down to us, faith according to the apostles. That is solid stuff. You should pursue it. You should study doctrine. You should be rooted in it. What Paul's talking about here is all the other doctrines, all the other beliefs uh, that come about in our culture. If you've ever been to college, oh my gosh, you have heard some stuff, right? I remember leaving here, I was 18 years old, and went to school at Oklahoma State University, and I started hearing junk I've never even heard before. I'm like, are you serious? Like, they're, they're sharing philosophies about life and perspectives, and I'm like, how do you even consider yourself sane to be thinking that, Right? Now, here's the trouble with that, though. It's not those crazy ones that get us. It's the more subtle stuff, isn't it? Let me think about this. If you're an enemy and you want to deceive the church, and you can get them to deviate just a little, but over time, because you've deviated from the truth, you find yourself further and further and further away from the truth, that's a lot easier to sell than someone taking a 90-degree right turn, departing from the truthfulness of God's Word, right? Right? So when he's talking about doctrine here, it's false doctrines that are going to seem appealing to us. It's buying into some other philosophy other than what the Scriptures would teach. I told our first service today, um, I just want to warn you here, one of the areas that we can buy into other philosophies, outside philosophies other than what's taught in Scripture, uh, is going to be according to your politics. Like Sometimes the church is more well-versed in conservatism or liberalism or libertarianism or wherever you might fall on the spectrum, we are more well-versed in those philosophies and those ideas than we are that of Scripture. And so Paul's like, hey, hey, be careful. You shouldn't stay there. You shouldn't remain as a child swayed by those things, but instead you should be faithful. We should be faithful according to the Scriptures. But he goes on. He talks about every wind of doctrine, but also the trickery of Men, And this is basically where we would just be led astray in, in, in some more practical way. So uh, the word trickery here, it actually has to do with, it gives the image of, of like playing dice. So in the first century, um, people would roll dice, right? This was kind of one of those things, this is going to be fun, I might even make some money, going to toss some dice, do a little bit of gambling. 
Well, the trouble was, was the people running the games, they were scamming people, right? They were defrauding them of their money. They promised them, hey, you're going to get something good out of this in reality. They were stealing from them. This is one of the games that the enemy plays in our life. Promises abundance. Hey, if you'll begin to walk this path, if you'll pursue this other thing, you're going to find abundance there. You're going to see prosperity. Life's going to be good. You're going to have it easy. But in these paths, the enemy wants to steal from you in the same way. So we can deviate in overt doctrine, like start believing crazy things about the Bible for sure. But also we can divert our path a little bit. And stop walking the path of Jesus Christ in humble submission to him and his word. We can begin to deviate, pursuing the things of this world and in this life. And the final thing here, we see craftiness in deceitful scheming. This is just kind of simple trickery, if you will. This is just a a simple, like, here's what happens in my household. I know your kids never do this, and you didn't either. Uh, But every morning as I get ready to send my kids to school, I'm like, did y'all brush your teeth? And, of course, they're all like, absolutely, yes, Dad, I brush my teeth. And so with my my six-year-old, I'm like, I'm going to check your toothbrush, and if it's not wet, you're in trouble. And he'll be like, hey, Dad, I was just kidding, right? I I mean, I I was just, that was just a trick. I was just playing a, a joke on you. Well, what it was, he was lying to me, right? It was pretty overt. He just wasn't telling the truth. And in the same way, there is an enemy out there that wants to lie to you. Hey, take this path. Man, the path of a disciple, that's hard, right? Following the Word of God, man, it's, the Scripture, it's, it's difficult. Hey, let's just, just walk this path for a little bit. It's going to seem more pleasing, to be honest with you. My kids don't want to brush their teeth because they don't see the value in it. They don't know that if they don't, there's a consequence to pay, a long-term consequence. Their teeth are not going to do well, and that's painful as you get older. In the same way, we don't always see the end game of, of walking the path of a disciple. So the enemy's like, hey, why don't, you, why don't you try this path? This seems easier. This storm is going to blow in your life. This storm is going to rage throughout the church until the day that we go and we meet with Jesus. Your enemy is going to be at work. He wants to deceive you. He wants to lead your life astray. And oftentimes he'll do it by small, subtle, little steps just to get you to deviate from God's path. And within a week or month or years even, you find yourself far from where Jesus Christ would have you to be, far from walking in accordance to his word, far from walking in holiness. But I told you, there's a way to avoid that. God has given us protection from being deceived. Again, the problem of being deceived is you don't know that you're being deceived, right? And so he says, as a result, we're no longer to be immature children, swayed and tricked and and deceived. So what is this a result of? So look back here in verse 11. Paul is describing how the church was built up and how the church was formed, ultimately how the church is supposed to function. In verse 11 he says, And he gave some as apostles... These are the men who walked with Jesus, who saw the resurrected Christ. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists. These evangelists would have been the the missionaries who would have gone into Ephesus or Philippi, and they would have preached the gospel there. They would have seen the church being born. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And here is why he did that. Paul's like, hey, if you want to know why God has ordered it the way that he has, He gave these people in these various roles for, in verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service or the work of ministry. This this seems a really strange answer, but bear with me, right? You know who the saints are, right? We are the saints. Paul would often address his letters to the saints who are in Corinth or Philippi or Colossae. And so the saints are people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And he's saying, God has ordered the church in such a way that the saints would be equipped to do the ministry. So um, here in our church, uh, we do not consider our staff to be the ministers, right? Now, we have a role in ministry because we're a part of the church. But we see ourselves as the equippers of those who are here, the saints who are going to do the ministry. Now, here's why he did that. Look, Look at what Paul says. So these guys are given for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. 
I want you to think about this process of maturity that's happening. It says, God has ordered the church, he's arranged the church in such a way that the body might be equipped for the work of ministry. And what happens is that every single member in the body of Christ has been given a gift. You can see this back in verse 7. That God, according to his grace, has gifted every single member in the church with a spiritual gift. And the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, they have equipped us for this work of ministry where we begin to come together using our gifts to build one another up. That means we don't stay immature, but we're strengthened. That means that we're encouraged in the midst of our discouragement. That means when the storms and the winds, they begin to blow, that we're not alone there in that storm, but we have people that can help us see when we're being deceived. We have people to encourage us when we get discouraged. So he says this, you've been given for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until he's like, you guys, you should continue to meet and be the church of Jesus Christ. Each of you uh, contributing the gifts that you've been given to build up the whole. Can I I just want to say this to you? This church needs you. Like, if God has called you here to be a part of this body, we need you. Like God has arranged us here. He's called us to Cross Community Church and Poto and Pecola, and, and he has placed us here on purpose. We need you. If we are going to be built up and strong, if we're going to be protected from these storms, we need you. But let me just say this a little more personally. You need The church, it was John Calvin, one of the early reformers, Protestant Reformation. He talked about how not everyone or, well, no one in the church has every gift, but instead how we are dependent upon one another. Can I say this? I said you need the church. Can I say this? I need you. Every member of this body needs the gifts that the other members bring to bear here. And here is why. He says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Rather than being immature children who are swayed by every wind of doctrine, every new idea, every new philosophy, he's like, hey, we got to be the church. we got to be strengthening and building one another up, like devoted to each other in brotherly love. And we do this until we attain to the unity of faith, until we are unified around the faith is handed down to us by the apostles. That's the faith contained in the Word of God. Man, when we're unified in the faith, we know it. We're no longer swayed by what's not true because we're rooted in what is. And so we use our gifts to teach, to encourage, to show mercy so that we might be unified in the faith. But it goes on. He says the second thing here is in the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, the Apostle Paul, educated under Gamaliel, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had a pretty good resume in Christianity, right? I mean, he did um, persecute the church and maybe put some Christians to death. I mean, he had some, some negative marks, but I mean, the guy, he got to plant a lot of churches, preach in a lot of places. He saw people healed. He had a good resume, right? But he said this. He said, I count all of those things as loss in light of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus the Lord for whose sake I have lost all things. You know that the greatest in in all of life for any one of us is to know Christ Jesus the Lord. You may not realize this, but when you serve this body, when you trust that the Holy Spirit is powerful, that he can use you and you begin to use your gifts in service to this body, you are helping people know Jesus Christ more. When they see your service, when they benefit from your gifts, you're helping them know Jesus Christ more. Nobody here serves in vain. Tonight, we're going to have a, a volunteer banquet. For those who have volunteered in our church, those who, who serve, there's a couple hundred people. This sermon is literally preaching to the choir because we got a lot of people who use their gifts here. Uh, but th- in this volunteer banquet, we're going to celebrate people that have cleaned toilets and and mow the lawn, and people who have done things that you'll never even see, people that do maintenance around this building. like We have no idea all that happens from the volunteers here. Here's the thing. Not a single one of those people serve and use their gifts in vain. But God takes this five loaves and two fish, what might seem insignificant as we offer ourselves in service to the body, and he uses it to help people know Jesus Christ. And church, We have a community that needs to know Jesus Christ. We have a church that needs to be built up. Paul's like, you know how 
you avoid being swayed by every wind of doctrine, persisting for the rest of your life in immaturity. It's by being meaningfully connected to the church, offering what God has given you and receiving what God has given other people until we attain the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God. And then he talks about until we attain to a mature man, leaving childish immaturity behind, and instead we become mature. How mature, you might ask. He says, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Y'all, that's a pretty high bar. The measure of the stature belongs to Christ. We're going to have to keep being the church to one another until Jesus returns, right? We're never going to be perfected, but that's it. Until we are conformed to the full image of God, we're walking in his abundance fully, um, then we can stop being the church. Can I, can I just say this to you? There is this really awful misconception in our culture that we should go to church. Now, we do gather here weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, We've never been called to go to church in the scriptures. We're called to be the church to one another. You know what my family never says to one another? Hey, let's go to family today. Like, yeah, we're, we're going to go to family. We're going to, you know, do our, our little deal. It's going to be a couple hours, and we're all going to go off and do our thing. No, we are a family. The church, we don't go to church. We are the church. We serve one another, and we care for each other. And my kids, um, they're newer to this process. They're, they're younger, and they're learning that they don't just have something to glean from our family. They have something to contribute to the family. And so uh, Piper's learning to do dishes, and Logan's learning to mow the lawn. And we're all, like, as a family, we serve one another that we might be built up and strengthened in the same way. That's how the church is supposed to organize ourselves. We're supposed to be using our gifts to serve the body. And as a result, when we come together using our gifts to strengthen and encourage and build one another up, as a result, we are no longer children blown and tossed. Listen, these storms are going to rage. You need the church, and the church needs you to use your gifts to be meaningfully connected to the body. You know, there's a big difference in being a part of the body and being a body part. You know what I'm saying? To be a part of the body is to benefit from the body and to give benefit to the body. To be a body part is to be disconnected, right? That's just gross. That, that's not how uh, things should be. Like body parts, they're meant to be connected. That's where we glean life. And in the same way, for us as believers, we're meant to be connected. Look in verse 15 here. Paul says, no longer children tossed here and there by waves, but speaking the truth in love. There will be times where you need to have the truth spoken to you in love. Where you need to have a relationship deeply enough with someone that you're willing to submit to their wisdom in your life. When you're being deceived, the greatest gift anyone can give you is the truth spoken in love. We need each other. And he says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects, into him who is the head, even Christ. We're the body. Jesus Christ is our head. We need each other if we're going to be the body. If we're going to be effective, we're going to do what Jesus has called us to do. We need one another. He goes on, he says, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Y'all, we got a big mission. Man, you walk around our community, people need Jesus Christ. And there's people being led astray. There's people that are suffering under the weight of sin and brokenness in our world. And we need to be the church to the world. But before we do that effectively, we've got to be the church to each other. There's an idea in our culture, um, American individualism. You all know what I'm talking about? That's the pull yourself by, up by your own bootstraps kind of idea that nobody gets in my business. Like, don't tell me what to do. I can make my own decisions. I've got this. I don't need you. I can make it on my own. Can I tell you, that's a profoundly unbiblical idea. The truth of it is, is the people of God will never be what God has called us to be on our own. We need each other. If you look in the scriptures, isolation is a sign of immaturity. I told you about the Highland family and the tragedy, uh, the loss of life of that young kid. 
the harm done to those people. And the reason it was so tragic, because they were disconnected, they never got any of the warnings. There was plenty of time for them to escape the wildfire that was coming. There was plenty of time for them to escape the harm because they were isolated, they were disconnected, they were almost devoured. Can I tell you it's true for us? More than ever in these difficult seasons, we need one another. So what does it look like for us to be meaningfully connected here at Cross Community? Because there are some brass tacks to this, right? What does it look like for you to be meaningfully connected to where you receive the benefit of the body and the body benefits from you? So just I'm going to give you uh, four quick things. Number one, become a member of this church. If you've been coming here for a while, you believe in our doctrine, you're like, okay, this is a, a biblical church. We believe in their doctrine. I trust in their leadership. It's time to become a member. And the reason we want you to do that is because the elders of this church have been called to shepherd the flock of God. We can't shepherd sheep who we don't know their names. So one of the things that we would ask every one of you to do is just say, I'm going to commit to being a member of this church. I'm going to let people know my name, that the shepherd or that the elders could ultimately watch out for me. That's part of our role. But also, if we're going to be a church, a body that depends on each other, we need to know who each other are. So number one, become a member. Number two, I'm going to ask you to commit to community, something you hear us say here a lot. That means you get into a community group, you do life closely enough with a group of people that they could speak the truth to you in love. Y'all, I can fake it up here on a Sunday for 32 minutes while I stand up and preach. I can put on a smile, and I can make you think that my life is going pretty well. But the people who do life closely with me, the people who see me when my kids are really frustrating me, or things aren't going so well at home, they're the ones that see the real Jason. They're the ones that see the, the cracks that might be there in my character. They're the ones who I need to speak the truth to me in love. And you need to have people in your life who see you and who know you, who can speak the truth, who you're willing to submit yourself to. So number one, um, become a member of this church. Number two, commit yourself to a community of people that you walk through life with them, trust them to speak into you. Number three, you begin to use your gifts to serve this body. I feel like I am preaching to the choir in many ways. I know many of you are meaningfully connected. You're serving. Uh, but one of the things that helps us to grow in our faith is we begin to trust God to work through us, offering Him what we have. We experience that God does indeed do things through us that we could never do on our own. Welcome to the dependence of being a Christian. So if you're not serving somewhere, I'd love for you to plug in, connect, just begin to serve, and watch what God does through you. The fourth and final thing, this is something you can do every minute of every day, is that you just begin to pray for this body. You know what I don't have to be reminded to do? Pray for my kids. My wife, man, I'm rooting for them. I'm with them. I want them to grow. I want them to become, like I pray every night with my boys. I want them to become godly men and husbands and fathers. My daughter to become a godly woman, wife, and mother. I'm praying for their good. I'm praying for their protection, right? Because they're my family. In the same way, when we are the church, when we're being the church of Jesus rather than just attending, then we're praying for each other, rooting for one another. So today, this is your invitation to meaningfully connect to this body, that you might be protected from the things of this world. You might have people in your life who can speak the truth to you in love. Let me pray for you. Father, we're thankful for your word, and we're thankful that you've given us the provision of your church to help protect us uh, in the midst of a, a, really a world where it's so easy to be led astray. There's so much deception. Father, we want to walk with you. We want to know you. We want to be mature in you, built up until the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ is true of us. So, Lord, we pray that you might have your way here. I pray that we might be a body that functions for your glory and our good. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.